All right, so welcome everyone to the webinar today. I'm really, really excited uh, to engage this very important conversation with you. Uh, I am Carta Elise Hassler with the Pet Sustainability Coalition, um, and really honored to uh, in, bring in our special guest, Adam Gundel from the Sustainable Packaging Coalition, um, a longtime partner of the Pet Sustainability Coalition. Um, I, again, am your member implementation manager. I'm really here to support all of our member companies in implementing strategies that help us fulfill this vision that we have of a thriving and collaborative pet industry that's creating positive impact for the communities and the environments where we do business. And if you are one of our members, you are in very good company, 60 plus and continuing to grow. And we work with all of our member companies to really accelerate your business through profitable social and environmental practices. And in order to do that, we need a place to start. Uh, we really believe in measuring what matters and we partner with B-Lab in order to do that. B-Lab is the nonprofit that certifies benefit corporations, which is a growing global movement of companies that really believe business can be a force for good. We work with B-Lab to implement a special assessment that enables us to get really great insight into your company's social and environmental performance. And from there, we can build custom sustainability strategy that's aligned with your goals. So just to give you a little bit of context of how the PSC works with our member companies, we really believe in measuring what matters and packaging is definitely uh, an important realm to be paying attention to. Um, this, uh, this last spring, the PSC released its updated toolkit. And one particular section in there focuses in on packaging and life cycle assessment. Um, this has been a hot topic with many of our member companies. You can see a great example here where our member company Excel Packaging partnered with Zooks to really analyze what is the full life cycle um, of the packaging that we're working with and what happens if, in this case, this was a light weighting example. And you can see there are some really meaningful reduced impacts there. That the way that we um, worked this project with Zooks and Excel was through a partnership um, with Triac, who runs the Compass software. And that Compass software, to bring it all the way back full circle, um, was actually developed by the Sustainable Packaging Coalition, um, who is our special guest today, Associate Director Adam Gendel. From here, Adam, I am going to pass um, the baton over to you to share your screen. And Adam joins us with a wealth of knowledge and experience um, in the realm of life cycle packaging, um, and we're really excited to learn more. So over to you, Adam. Well, thank you so much, Carter, at least. Um, please holler at me if my audio is not good or if my slides aren't working like they uh, look like they are on my end. Um, before I start, I want to say um, it's really my privilege to be here today with you all in the couple years that I've gotten to know and learn about the pet coalition and its members. I've just been so impressed with the amount of uh, receptiveness folks have shown towards this uh, very funny world that is my world entire of packaging sustainability. So the content of today's presentation is going to be really full and I'm going to issue an apology in advance because I'm really going to stretch the time limit that I was allocated today. Uh, I was asked to give a presentation that explains some of the foundational concepts in the world of bio-based and biodegradable packaging. And I feel like I really can't do that without uh, at least introducing the concepts of all of these words that show up in packaging sustainability conversations that, you know, most at least include that phrase bio. So each of these uh, six words you see here in green today, I am going to define them for you and then talk a little bit about what each one means, what it doesn't mean, and how they're all related. So we are going to start with the phrase bio-based. So here you're looking at the definition of the phrase bio-based. It simply means that we're referring to materials that are wholly or partially derived from biomass, such as plants, trees, or animals. Now, you'll hear the word bio-based, you'll hear the word renewable, you'll hear the term plant-based. They are basically all equivalent interchangeable terms. So um, 
I want to make that clear that um, although there are, are, are a number of terms that are often confused, uh, it can be even more confusing when there are three terms that mean the exact same thing, but that's what we have here. So to emphasize this, the phrase bio-based solely refers to the feedstock that the packaging material was made of. In terms of life cycle thinking, it's important to recognize that that is the beginning of the life cycle. And so bio-based, we want to associate that with the beginning. Let's turn to biodegradable. So biodegradable is very different. Now we're referring to the capability of a material to be decomposed by bacteria or other living organisms. So the term biodegradable is the opposite end of the life cycle. When we're talking about biodegradability, we're talking about what happens at the end of life. All right, before I go further, I have to talk about bioplastics. This is where things get a little complicated. So a bioplastic is a plastic that is bio-based, biodegradable, or both. Now, this often can be a little confusing because I think intuitively we all want to associate bio-based with biodegradable. If something is made from plants or animals, we tend to think that it will probably return to that biological uh, end of that cycle at its end of life, with that being biodegradation. Let's think about this in the context of bioplastic. So I told you that a bioplastic could be bio-based, it could be biodegradable, or it could be both. So in that and since the real best way to think about bioplastics is this. In the green, we have a whole family of bio-based plastics, that being plastics made from plants or animals or trees. In the blue, we have an entire family of biodegradable plastics. And then in the middle, because it's a Venn diagram, we see that there must be some plastics that are both. They are both bio-based and biodegradable. So if it is any of those three, it counts as a bioplastic. I trust that I've confused at least a few of you so far, and so I'm going to do it further. We can look at plastics in this type of quadrant-based grid system, right? So on the left, we see that there's a row of bio-based plastics. On the bottom, there's a row of fossil-based plastics. And then we can cross that with a uh, column on the left of plastics that are inherently biodegradable. And then the column on the right that constitutes plastics that are inherently non-biodegradable. And I think the great surprise for a lot of us is that we can find a plastic in each of these quadrants. So we can find some type of plastic out there that is each of the combinations of being bio-based or not bio-based and being biodegradable or non-biodegradable. Now, I usually like to depict it more like this because um, our intuition is not entirely wrong. Most of the plastics we learn about that are bio-based are biodegradable, so it gets the big check mark. And on the bottom right, most of the plastics we know about that are not bio-based, that are fossil-based, are not biodegradable. So let me go through this a little bit and, and kind of prove my point with some examples here. Uh, I will not be explaining what any of these acronyms mean. Some of these I'm not really familiar with, but um, just to prove that there are polymers, and of course polymers all have acronyms that start with P, um, there are polymers that exist in each of these quadrants. So let's talk about them. All right. These are the ones that we're all most familiar with, fossil-based plastics that are inherently non-biodegradable. Those are conventional plastics, like what we see here. This is a PET water bottle. It would have the resin identification code number one. It's made from fossil resources, most likely natural gas, and it will not biodegrade at its end of life. Of course, this one is a recyclable bottle, so I don't think it deserves to be dinged for not being biodegradable. All right, but let's move on. So what you're looking at now is a bio-based version of that same plastic. So this is the new Dasani water bottle that uses Coca-Cola's plant bottle technology, which means it's about 30% made from plant-based inputs. So this might surprise you because this is the exact same plastic. This is still PET. Chemically, it is polyethylene terephthalate, PET. The only way to tell this bottle apart from this bottle would be to use radiocarbon dating and learn exactly how recently the carbon atoms in the plastic came from the atmosphere. So um, again, we can make polymers out of plants that are exactly the same as the polymers that we traditionally make from fossil resources, which is pretty cool. All right, so let's talk about the um, uh, biodegradable plastic family now. So 
What we're looking at here is a plastic that is both bio-based and biodegradable. This is a PLA cup. It's most likely made from a corn-based feedstock. I think a lot of us are probably familiar with this, right? It's made from plants, and then this particular one is compostable, so it has that opportunity to return to the biological cycle at its end of life. Rounding us out here, um, the one that might be the most surprising, that there are plastics on the market that are made from fossil resources but are inherently biodegradable, which is really a miracle of modern science. So uh, the example I chose to show here is a bio bag, and I realize it's, it's probably not the best example because it's got a picture of corn on it, and you're saying, well, Adam, you just told us this is fossil-based. It, it sure looks like it's corn-based. Bio bag specific technology uses both. It's some percentage of a corn-based, bio-based plastic, but the remaining percentage of the plastic in a bio bag is actually a fossil-based plastic called PBAT, P-B-A-T. I have no clue what that acronym stands for, but it is a fossil-based plastic that is inherently biodegradable. In fact, it's compostable. So almost every green compostable can liner we'll see is made from this bio bag technology and does have a blend of plant-based plastic and conventional fossil-based plastic, which is pretty wacky. So the point I want to make here is that we have to decouple the concepts of bio-based and biodegradable. A bio-based plastic may or may not be biodegradable, and conversely, a biodegradable plastic may or may not be bio-based. So again, we can find examples with each combination of those. All right, what about the word compostable? So now that we understand what biodegradable means, how much should we equate it with the term compostable? Well, let me find that word compostable for you. So here's our definition of biodegradable again. We already read that. Here's the definition of compostable. I'm gonna go back. Biodegradable, compostable. Compostability refers to the capability of being decomposed by bacteria or other living organisms in the conditions of a composter within a suitably short amount of time to produce usable compost. So if you wanna think about it this way, it's, it's sometimes helpful to consider it as um, biodegradable plus some other constraints. So uh, as a visual depiction, we have this giant family of biodegradable materials and a subset of those are compostable materials. A subset of all the biodegradable materials out there will biodegrade in the conditions of a composter in that reasonably short amount of time to produce safe, usable compost. So again, to stress the point here, we can't necessarily equate biodegradability with compostability. All compostable materials are biodegradable, right? Because they're within that family but a biodegradable material may or may not be compostable. A few quick notes about compostability and compostable packaging. There are two main flavors of composting. Home composting, that's what we do at home in our backyards, and then industrial composting. And almost every single type of packaging you see that is certified to be compostable is referring to the system of industrial composting. Just to give you an idea of what they look like, these are some photos of industrial composters. These are huge, large-scale facilities. Uh, because they're so big, these compost piles generate tremendous amounts of heat due to the microbial activity, and that heat is really what distinguishes industrial composting from home composting, because heat uh, helps break down a lot of materials that we can't do at home. So we have to talk about uh, at least a little bit of the uh, availability of these industrial composting facilities because it's important to keep that in mind when we're considering putting uh, ind uh, industrially compostable packaging out on the market. So the biggest family of industrial composters will only take in yard waste, that being lawn trimmings, branches, uh, and so on. A subset will add food waste to the mix, so they'll take both yard waste and food waste, and then a subset of that subset will take yard waste, food waste, and compostable packaging. And of course, we encourage composters who want food waste to also take compostable packaging because that generally gets them a lot of food service wear, which gets them more food waste, which is what they really, really want. So to put that in a little bit of a visual depiction, here's a, um, uh, a graphic of the total number of composters per state in the US. And then if you'll train your eyes on it, here are the number of facilities that collect food waste. So all composters, the subset that collect food waste. We don't have data on that subset within the subset that take compostable packaging in addition to food waste, but understandably it would be smaller than this set. So these shades of blue would become even lighter. 
Now we can be glass half empty or glass half full about this. The glass half empty statement is that there really is a limited prevalence of industrial composters in the US that will take packaging. Glass half full impression is that today there are few, but look at the total number of composters. There's a lot of opportunity out there to evolve those that take yard waste into accepting both uh, food waste and packaging additionally. The main reason why industrial composters aren't um, overly willing to open up their doors to packaging are encapsulated by these two pictures. So on your left, you see some pretty good looking compost, but there is some polystyrene cutlery in there. So that's conventional, uh, non-compostable plastic cutlery. And they probably got their uh, food waste and compostable packaging from some type of food service operator that was using all compostable packaging except the cutlery. So now this compost manufacturer has plastic in their compost and obviously they don't want that. On the right is the other issue, and these are certified compostable pieces of cutlery, but they didn't biodegrade fast enough. And that's the main critique of the industrial composting certifications that are out there, is that they are um, generalized, but every composter is different. And some of them wanna turn out compost really fast. So it's a very complicated relationship between composters and compostable packaging. I could talk all day about it. Uh, I will not today because I can't, but I, I would feel remiss if I didn't introduce those concepts. Okay, the last section of this presentation focuses on uh, our bottom right quadrant of my grid here. So we're gonna talk about the conventional plastics out there, those that are inherently non-biodegradable and also made from fossil resources. And I think you'll understand now why I chose to add that extra word inherently when I talk about non-biodegradable plastics. So the topic I wanna to cover are, is biodegradability additives. And I define them as such, additives intended to enable biodegradability in inherently non-biodegradable fossil-based plastics. So the basic idea is you take a traditional plastic, you use this additive, and then you transform that plastic from being non-biodegradable into one that is biodegradable. There are two major categories of these additives on the market. The, what I call the first generation are the OXO biodegradable, or you might see them termed OXO degradable or simply OXO. The next generation has even more names. Uh, we'll see landfill biodegradable. There's also terms like enzyme mediated biodegradability. Uh, there's really, there's a, there's a number, there's a new one every day. Uh, they're very different though. So I wanna tell you as, as fast as I can about the important differences between them. So we'll start with the first generation. These are OXO biodegradable additives. Here's the basic premise. You put this OXO degradable additive in your plastic. Here, we'll consider a plastic bag. The additive is intended to be triggered when the plastic is in the presence of light and oxygen. Oxygen, OXO, OXO biodegradable. So in the presence of sunlight and oxygen, the additive triggers and the plastic begins to fragment. And then it fragments. If it has continued exposure of light and oxygen, it fragments more until theoretically it fragments into very, very tiny pieces of plastic that are small enough to be consumable by microorganisms because that's what biodegradation is. I want us to think about these very, very small, very fragmented tiny pieces of plastic. And this is where I get into my critique of biodegradability additives. So I think we're all familiar with the concept of microplastics and I, I would wager that most of us have probably read something or seen something fairly alarming about the persistence of microplastics in the environment. The point that I, I want to be made about the OXO biodegradable family of additives is this. When we have very, very small pieces of plastic, particularly when they make their ways into the waterways, which a lot of terrestrial litter does, We've learned that plastics don't always float in the marine environment. And in fact, the smaller they get, the more prone they are to reaching downwards in the water, water column. In fact, I think it was uh, two or three weeks ago that we had some very alarming news that plastic pollution was found in the very bottom of the Mariana Trench. So we know that there are plastics all throughout the water column. When plastics are underwater, they are deprived of that presence of both sunlight and oxygen. So we worry that these OXO biodegradable additives simply trigger fragmentation and get plastics down to a small enough size where they might become submersed in water and not in the environment in which they would actually have real biodegradation triggered. Another point to be made against the use of OXO biodegradable additives is this. So without going into the science, this is what happens when, so when something, anything, biodegrades 
aerobically. That means with oxygen. And again, oxo-degradable plastics need oxygen. So this is the type of biodegradation that happens. So again, we've got very tiny pieces of plastic. We have microbes that are capable of consuming them. The products of this biodegradation are on your right. Theoretically, there's some biomass, that's the soil amendment nutrients. And then we have some off-gassing. Uh, with aerobic biodegradation, we create water and we create CO2, carbon dioxide. I have to talk a little bit about that carbon dioxide because we all know that carbon dioxide generally is not something that we want to encourage. There's a little bit of nuance there that I have to share. So if we think about plant-based materials, they participate in what we call the biogenic carbon cycle. And put as simply as I can, it, it means that we are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, it's being stored in plants, and then when those plants reach their end of life, whatever that might be, the carbon dioxide is re-released into the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide out into the plant, the plant dies, the carbon dioxide goes back into the atmosphere. That's considered a net neutral carbon cycle. So there's nothing wrong with that. But if we're talking about fossil-based plastics, we have to understand that there is no naturally occurring carbon cycle for fossil carbon. So any carbon that's emitted from a biodegrading fossil-based plastic is considered a man-made greenhouse gas emission. So that's another issue that we take with these biodegradability additives in fossil-based plastics is that any of the carbon-based emissions resulting from the process of biodegradation are harmful greenhouse gas emissions. We're also concerned about the message that consumers are sent when they see products marketed as being biodegradable. There's a fascinating study, it's a few years old, from Keep America Beautiful um, that showed, I don't remember the percentage, but it was something, it, it was a non-negligible percentage of an increased likelihood that a consumer will litter an item when they see it marketed as being biodegradable. So if we think about some of the common applications that we'll see these oxo-biodegradable additives used in, um, such as water balloons or dog waste bags, I, I think it, it's, it's fairly um, a common sense conclusion to envision consumers being more prone to leaving these in the open environment, which is of course not the behavior we want to ingrain in consumers when we all have a shared responsibility to encourage much more responsible disposal. So our argument here is that creating this type of litter-friendly material is really a step in the wrong direction. I also have to mention that recyclers are categorically opposed to recycling conventional plastics with biodegradability additives. So the example I've heard used is if you imagine you're uh, driving down the highway and you're behind a flatbed truck with a load of bricks on the back and it has PET strapping over it, this type of strapping is often made from recycled PET packaging, you don't want that plastic to all of a sudden have its biodegradability triggered because it's out in the open sun with the presence of oxygen. So plastic recyclers are opposed. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation through their new plastics economy project has released a global position state that's been widely endorsed against the use of OXO biodegradable additives. My organization, the Sustainable Packaging Coalition has taken a similar position. Um, and our position includes the OXO biodegradable additives, but also the next generation additives, which I'd like to address as quickly as I can. So these additives are different. They're intended to be triggered when the plastic is landfilled, when it is in a microbially rich environment. So that can conjure up some images of plastic returning to some type of naturally occurring biological cycle. And I want to stress that that really won't happen in a landfill because I have to remind us that landfills are highly regulated and highly engineered to prevent any interaction of the waste within with the natural environment. So um, we should have no envisionment of plastic in the landfill uh, suddenly biodegrading and being turned into wildflowers. It ain't gonna happen. Recyclers are also categorically opposed to recycling plastics with this type of additive in them. And the example that I'll show here, these are pipes made from recycled high density polyethylene. And we can imagine these could be used uh, for sewer, for a drainage field, or for some application where there will be a lot of microbial activity. So plastic recyclers want to put out durable products. They really like the idea that plastic is durable and doesn't suddenly biodegrade because they want to put out a long lasting product. Plastic recyclers don't want to make pipes from a plastic that might biodegrade if it finds itself in the presence of microbes. This type of additive causes a different type of biodegradation. This time it's anaerobic. That means without oxygen. The difference is that this type of biodegradation 
emits carbon dioxide and methane, that's CH4, that's methane, uh, in about equal amounts, about half carbon dioxide, half methane. Uh, a lot of us probably know, but for those of us who don't, methane is considered to be 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide in terms of its greenhouse gas potential. So again, being that these are all considered man-made greenhouse gas emissions, we have to understand that when something uh, would be designed to biodegrade in a landfill, we're going to get that much more harmful methane in addition to just the carbon dioxide. The main argument used by the manufacturers of these landfill biodegradable additives is that landfills tend to collect their methane and they tend to turn it into uh, energy, renewable energy that offsets grid energy, and maybe that is a net benefit. Um, our assessment shows that it is not. Yes, every landfill, most landfills are required to collect their methane, that's an EPA regulation. A minority of them transfer that captured methane to a usable energy to offset fossil fuel uh, grid energy. So I, given more time, I would love to take us through um, this, this little bit of equation here. But since I don't have time, I'll simply say that uh, landfills will um, emit carbon dioxide and methane even if they do have the gas capture system in place because a lot of it will escape. And then anything that's combusted is going to transform that methane back into carbon dioxide. So if I'll draw your attention towards the bottom line, and we can see that biodegradation of conventional fossil-based plastics in landfill still is very net harmful from a greenhouse gas perspective. I will stop there. I see I've left us maybe a couple minutes for questions. <clears throat> um, if folks can stay afterwards our time, I'm happy to stick around. If you can't, my email address is at the bottom of the slide, as is the web address for my organization, Sustainable Packaging Coalition. If you'd like to learn more about our work or if you'd like to follow up with me on any of these concepts that I've introduced in a very rapid fire fashion, I would be happy to do so. I will close there and happily turn it back over to Carta Elise. Adam, thank you so very much for condensing some really um, nuanced information into such a short you know, span of time. At this point, what questions are there? What questions do you all have? Feel free to come off of mute. Come on to a video if you feel inspired. Wow, I think we've stumped them. Looks like there's a question coming in through chat. Give me just a minute. I'm coming back to my screen here. Let's see. So, Scott, okay. I see I see two questions on the chat, and I'm happy to address both of them. Great, thank you. All right. If you could just read them out loud, so that yep. uh, for the recording, thank you. Absolutely. So, this question asks: Are you aware of any landfill biodegradable packaging material that can be used for liquids for liquid packaging? Um, and my response is that the landfill biodegradability additives are marketed as being used for any plastic for, for any application. Of course, uh, you won't hear me or my organization advise that they be used. Um, in general, we, we don't really want any packaging to biodegrade in the landfill. Um, and, and I realize that that's counterintuitive and it's certainly open for debate, but I always like to remind folks that landfills are our third largest source of man-made methane emissions because materials biodegrade in them. So I don't know if that answers your question, but, but my advice is, is no. Uh, the next question asks, are compostable dog poop bags a good thing? Um, which is a very important question, and I, I think the jury is really still out. Um, my understanding is that most composters don't want anything that would be considered hazardous waste. So I, I, I've not verified this, but I believe that in general composters um, probably frown upon accepting dog waste. Um, if we can find home compostable dog poop bags, which is a concept that I, I really didn't dwell on, um, it might be a different story. Um, I see we're at time. Cardalise, can I keep answering questions? Do you want to jump in? Okay, I'm going to keep answering questions. All right. Um, this is a really good question. What happens when bio-based compostable bags end up in a landfill? Um, it depends on the type of compostable plastic. So uh, if you'll recall, I said there are two types of biodegradation, aerobic with oxygen, anaerobic without oxygen. Composting is an aerobic type of operation. So some materials, or, or excuse me, all materials that are compostable will biodegrade in aerobic conditions. Those materials don't necessarily biodegrade in 
anaerobic conditions such as we would find in a landfill. So some compostable plastics will do almost nothing in a landfill. They will stay intact because they don't have the right microbial families that can consume them in the landfill. And certainly from a carbon perspective, that's a good thing because then in fact, we're taking carbon out of the atmosphere, locking it up in plants, um, transforming that to plastic, and then storing that atmospheric carbon in the landfill. Uh, other types of compostable plastics will biodegrade in both aerobic and anaerobic conditions. So some compostable plastics will biodegrade in the landfill. Uh, if someone wants to make the argument that it, it's a good thing for materials to biodegrade in the landfill simply because we can't have persistent materials indefinitely underground, I won't argue against you. Uh, from a carbon footprint perspective, it, it again is a net harmful thing. And real quick, I am going to jump in here. Um, Adam, I'm happy to stay on longer to answer these questions. And while we still have a handful of participants, I have a really quick poll. Um, we, the Pet Sustainability Coalition, are considering putting together a working group to really forward sustainable packaging options for this particular industry. So um, feel free to chime in on this poll. Uh, and Adam, I'll pass it back over to you to continue um, answering these questions. And you know, we'll stay on another few minutes as long as folks have questions and want to engage this conversation. Sure, thank you. Um, OK, so the next question I'm reading through chat asks for recommendations for companies to contact that are doing a great job creating sustainable packaging per PSC standards. Who, gosh, I wish I could recommend specific companies. I, I really can't. Um, I would say if this is a bit of a shameless plug, but if you want to check out the member list of my group, the Sustainable Packaging Coalition, we have uh, probably 100 or 150 packaging suppliers. Each of them uh, are at least committed to being in the conversation about sustainable packaging and learning about the issues and learning how they can address them. Can't promise that every one of our member companies is doing everything to address everything, but they're all working on it. So um, that's probably the best advice I could give. And to dovetail off of that, you know, this is why sustainability is not a destination. It is absolutely a journey. And it's why we, the PSC, take such a holistic, whole systems approach to it. So, you know, the best we can do is look for those companies that are doing their best to solve these problems um, and recognizing that there's not necessarily a silver bullet um, and that there is this ongoing commitment to continuous improvement. Um, so you can certainly look to the SPC as well as the PSC. You know, it's not, we don't really see it as our place to say, this is what you should do, but rather here are the options. Um, and we want you to be as educated as possible in, in making um, decisions that drive the most beneficial impact. So hopefully that's helpful too. Yes, that's, that's very well said. Um, we get that question a lot from our members, if we can simply recommend the most sustainable package for their product, and, and we can't. So our job is to make sure that our stakeholder groups learn the issues and understand the different ways of thinking about them. We like to leave people with more questions than answers, um, because nobody really has a silver bullet approach to, to solving all of the challenges around packaging. Uh, there's another question in the chat that I'd like to address, and it asks, um, what are your thoughts about the organizations that collect and recycle bags for us that would otherwise go into landfills? TerraCycle, Green Guru, etc. cetera. Um, I think these organizations are always a good thing. The important considerations are thinking about the volume collected. So um, in terms of recyclability, curbside recyclability is always best. I think a tier down we have uh, things like the retail store drop-off stream. So if you're familiar with grocery stores that have the widespread practice of collecting uh, plastic shopping bags at those special receptacles in the front of their stores, there's a lot of other types of film plastics that are acceptable in those. And then from a volume standpoint, certainly, uh, the next tier would be those sort of specialized niche programs like TerraCycle that are doing amazing things in finding home for hard to recycle plastics uh, from a volume perspective, uh, they're, they're a bit of a departure from what we might get in, in for instance, our curbside recycling systems. Um, okay, maybe the, the last question that I'd like to address uh, asks, is it better to use traditional plastic packaging that is not biodegradable than to use one of the additives? And I love that question. My answer is yes, it's better to use traditional plastic packaging that is not biodegradable than to use those additives. 
Um, what I always like to tell companies is that there are other opportunities to get a more sustainable plastic package. So if we think about the, the two loops of sustainable packaging, one is sort of this natural biological loop where we might be making materials from plants and then returning them back to the biosphere, uh, say through a composting operation. The other is termed um, the technosphere or the technical loop. And that talks about materials that are made from fossil resources or minerals. They tend to be very durable materials. And by keeping them in the technical cycle through recycling or even through reuse, that's a good thing too. So even if we're creating a non-recyclable package, a good way to participate in that technical cycle is to use recycled content. So that's providing a pull to get demand that the recycling system needs, even if you're not supplying the recycling system with recyclable material. Uh, even if you can't do that, um, being that my organization has a formal position against the use of the biodegradability additives, I would say yes, a traditional plastic is always better than one with the additives. Uh, Carta Elise, I think I better stop there. And uh, again, my, my email address was shared on the final slide, which I understand you will be distributing. I'd be more than happy for folks to follow up with me. Fantastic. Adam, again, can't thank you enough for, you know, your expertise, your years and years of experience uh, in this realm and the great work that the Sustainable Packaging Coalition does. Um, we're really honored to be in partnership with you all and to be able to really help drive education and better decision making in this whole realm. Um, I heard a couple of requests for learning more about recyclability, uh, which is certainly another side of this coin. So it's something that we may look to doing in the future. Um, and without further ado, I'll just say thank you to all of you for your time and attention with us here today. Don't hesitate to reach out to myself or to Adam with more questions. And this webinar is going to be posted online for you to download and every one of you that registered um, will get information on that and be able to access this to share with your colleagues um, and for posterity and reference in the future. So uh, without further ado for real this time, thank you all very much. Thank you, Adam, and everyone have a great day.